-hmm. So welcome, Pam. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. It's nice to be with you. Um, so what, what I'm what I'm hoping to do is I am going to take some of Al Gore's data because he updates it all the time. And so the most recent data from 2021 about what's actually happening, and it's not just another, you know, the sea levels are rising and it's getting hotter in the summers. I mean, what we, we're actually going to look at and what the data are showing us about how things are um, deteriorating rapidly. But once we've done that, and you've seen kind of the picture around the world, I'm gonna spend a considerable amount of time on what you can do about it. What, what, um, what you can do in your own home or apartment or condo, wherever you are, what you can do in the community and then what you can do at the state and national level. Because one, one of the things, um, just a, a personal story for you, one of the things that, that, I, um, that happened to me when I went to the training with Al Gore was he, he did that. He, he did his fast facts for about you know, several hours for all of us to learn from. And we were so depressed by how bad things are that it just felt like, you know, in some ways it caused some paralysis because we all felt like, well, whoa, what can possibly, how can we possibly respond to this, you know? And he didn't spend as much time on solutions. So all of those of us who have been trained decided that we were going to change the focus and we were going to lay out all the facts, but we were going to spend at least half the time on the solutions so that people don't leave feeling like uh, the earth is going to be uninhabitable and there isn't anything I can do about it. You know, because that is the feeling you get when you hear the first portion of this presentation, that it's, you know, th things, are very, things are quite serious now and they're getting more so uh, more rapidly than anybody thought they would. So, the, the goals of the day are to, to, to explain global warming, I mean, exactly what the causes are and the impact of it. But then, as I said, the general solutions that are underway, but then your specific role, what, what each of us can do. So that's kind of how I, I'm hoping to spend our time. Um, and then one other thing that we can do without having um, the data slides, you, you can't do these data slides. I mean, you can't do the data without the slides. It's just not clear. But one thing I can do is I can just make sure we all have the same definitions, that we're using the same definitions. And I didn't used to have this right. So I, I now feel more clear about it, that global warming as a term is the long-term warming of the planet. It does not have to do with an extra hot day in the summer, like weather, that's the weather, <laughs> or, or, or a, um, a one winter that's particularly cold or warm. It's a long-term trend and it's being caused by climate change. Sometimes they're used interchangeably, but climate change is the result of global warming. That's, that's what we're seeing. We, you and I, we're seeing the storms, the floods, the tornadoes, everything getting more volatile and intense because of global warming. But, we're, but climate change is what we see, is what we're seeing out there. So um, it just sometimes when I hear people say, oh, it's, it's, it's such a cold winter, there can't be global warming. <laughs> You know, there's no, that's not, that's not a, a cause and effect that you can talk about. It's, it's actually the, the long-term trend that we're looking at. And it is definitely a warming trend. There's no question. Um, so th those are the, those are the things I wanted us to have as, as, as a starting point as we get into this. So what do you think, Phyllis? Do you think we're going to be able to do this? Uh, yes, because Temple Harzine is now the host, and I hope she now makes me, Sheila, you'll make me the co-host, and then I can do it. 
Okay. He's on. Just so, in time. Just I in time. Know. Let's see. I'm not co host yet. I mean, I guess, Sheila, you can also let um, Pam yeah, share. Yeah, you, you can let me share my screen as well. Or make me co host one way or the other. I'm watching. Am I, or maybe, maybe you can just make me co-host and then I'll. Oh, that's another idea, Sheila. You can make me co-host and I'll share my screen from there. <laughs> She's clearly working on it. Yeah. What's that little dot? Hmm? No, there's a dot by, oh, goodness. Did I do that? Oh, and, and meanwhile, um, Cindy joined us. Mm -hmm. Hello, Cindy. Cindy, you want to say hi? I don't know who she is. Hi. Hi, C Cindy, where do you, um, you and I have know each other. From the Oak Park Cam group, yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought when I saw your name. I thought, I know her. Yeah, <laughs> long different circles, but I'm here to support the event and look forward to seeing um, the presentation. We're, we're trying to get her screen to be shared and... Um, you can often just go down to share screen and say let multiple people. I'm not the host. Yeah, I'm trying to get them to make oh. me the host. Well, I'll, I have for some reason I have I the share. share. Yeah. Shared screen feature on my. No, on no, my... no, no, no. We need. No, to... I did it. I think I did it. Good. Great. All right. Let's see if you can see it then. Yep. Can you? We can yeah. see it. It's okay. not in presentation mode, though. It's in the slide mode. You can go. you see it now? Yep. Um, but yeah, you you have to change the settings because it's showing us the notes view. Like if you go to display settings. Yeah, I'm there. just trying to find yeah. it. You're uh, talking to Pamela, not me, right, Cindy? Yeah. Whoever's controlling it. I think Phyllis is now the one controlling it. Oh, there you no. go. yeah. There, I think that I think that's full screen now. It yeah. is. That looks perfect. Yep. Okay. Um, well, then we've able to get started. That's great. Um, I I just like to show this picture at when I start these presentations because it's the um, first picture of the, of the Earth that was fully illuminated that any of us ever saw. And it was taken um, on the Apollo 17 mission when they were traveling uh, toward the moon back in 1972. And I, I show it just because the earth is a beautiful picture from space and we wanna keep it that way. So it's just for you to share the, the picture of the blue marble or the, the beautiful earth we live on. Um, but the, the view that I really was struck by when I first got my training was this one. This is the surface of the Earth, and it was taken from the International Space Station with the sun just coming over the horizon. And the reason that I really think it's worth starting with is that that thin blue ribbon is the atmosphere. It, it's, it's the sky that we look up and see every day and it looks you know it looks so limitless but it isn't it is very very narrow it's a thin ribbon of atmosphere and unfortunately uh, we are dumping or spewing 162 million tons of pollution into this little thin blue ribbon every day every single day and this is it's almost like you know uh the term open sewer it's like a sewer in the sky we just send this stuff up there and we think it disappears but of course it doesn't 
<laughs> it stays up there. Um, and that's the greenhouse effect that we're seeing. Um, some of the um, energy that comes from the sun is absorbed by the earth and the atmosphere holds in the warmth and then we can actually live on the earth. So that's a good thing. But some of that is trapped in the earth's atmosphere. And if you get too much carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases, then it doesn't escape. And since the atmosphere is only 60 miles thick, that little blue ribbon, 60 miles is nothing. And um, so the carbon dioxide is trapped and that's what's really going on. And, and the scientific consensus now is that global warming is increasing rapidly and it is mostly human caused. There is no more question about this. Um, in spite of some of the people that are still climate deniers. And these are, these are the big sources of greenhouse gases that you probably already know, but what, what we now know is what percentage each of them contributes to the, that warming of the atmosphere. There's, there's everything from coal mining to industry to coal plants to burning of crops, uh, fertilizing plants, um, everything that you can think of is, is part of man-made global warming. And here's the percentage breakdown. Um, and, and so what, I, what I've spent a lot of time working on myself is um, transportation in the past three years, because nationally transportation is the biggest has the biggest share of the pie, as you can see. And the only way to do something about that is to electrify our transit system, to get electric cars, to, to increase the electric cars on the road, to electrify our train system, um, to, and to walk more and bike more and take public transit. Those are all things that will help in the transportation sector. But one of the things that um, we're learning about Oak Park in particular, because I'm uh, with Cindy, I'm part of the Oak Park Climate Action Network. We're learning that in Oak Park, 73% of the emissions come from our residences, from our buildings. Um, so we can't really measure the transportation emissions in Oak Park because of the Eisenhower coming right through Oak Park. And we don't know how to, essentially it's difficult to figure out our transportation burden. Well, what we do know is that 73% of the greenhouse gases are coming from our houses. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind as we go through the presentation, because I'll come back to that. But in the end, I mean, this is, this is the largest source of global warming pollution the burning of fossil fuels. And look at how it has gone up since 1950. It, it's, it's an incredibly steep curve and it just continues to go up. And that's in spite of a lot of the actions that are being taken right now. Um, now, th this corresponds directly to global surface temperatures. And again, look at 1950 onward, uh, from the time of you know, the end of World War II to the present, um, there, there's an increasing trend toward warmer and warmer uh, climate and the planet in general is warming up. Uh, and, and this has really occurred quite rapidly since 1950. Uh, that's, that's very worrisome because the trend is, is continuing. Uh, I'm showing you that because that's just one picture of declining ice mass that's coming as a result. Um, the ice mass is just going down, 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 and not just the glaciers, the land mass of ice itself is, is going down and it's, and it's going down rapidly which is in turn raising sea levels. 
uh, around the world. Um, here's one picture that I thought was kind of interesting. This is another one in Greenland from Greenland, but I did not know this. Uh, this was recent data that Al Gore shared that, it, that the ice cap in Greenland is melting four times faster than originally thought. And it is the, the permanent ice sheet that is melting. Um, so we, we are definitely on a, on a, uh, a curve that we wanna stop. We wanna flatten that curve. Look at the Antarctic and the ice loss there. Now, this is in our lifetimes. Uh, at least it's in my lifetime. And in the last, I mean, the last eight years, um, the ice loss in billion metric tons in the Antarctic, whoo, it's just, it's just really, really rapid. Um, and that's something that obviously is also causing sea level rise. Um, now, what goes along with it? The things that we're seeing every day. Uh, what we see the most is the blue and the yellow, floods and mudslides and storms. You all know, I mean, everybody has experienced this extreme weather and we don't see it as much of it as say, if you live on the coast, either coast, but boy, in terms of droughts, and uh, floods and storms, uh, we have seen our share. And the, these weather catastrophes are on the rise. Um, so I, I just had to show you this one picture from last summer. Um, a, a new all time heat record in Europe, 119.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and the reason I showed it is because this is a local delicacy that people eat in Sicily and it was too hot and the, and the snails died in their shells. I mean, they were just too hot for people to even eat. And that was just last, last August. Um, so when you also look north into Siberia, uh, the temperature there in 2020 reached 100 Point four degrees Fahrenheit. That's the highest temperature on record in, in the Arctic. Um, so, you know, we, it, it, this extends, you know, north to south, the entire, the entire planet. Now, the good news is that it's good and bad, but the good news is that 93% of all this heat is trapped by the ocean. And the truth is that if it hadn't been trapped by the ocean all these years, we wouldn't have a livable planet right now. But because the ocean has been absorbing all this heat, it, we've had a slower, but now speeding up trend um, of, of um, man-made global warming pollution in our atmosphere. But the oceans now themselves are heating up. And so that is causing lots of die-offs of species. And I'm sure you've heard about the coral reefs, but it's also killing off all kinds of microorganisms that fish feed on. The entire ocean ecosystem is getting now disrupted. And ocean temperatures set a new record in 2018, 19, 20, and we don't have data yet for 2021, but I'm sure we'll see it. We'll also set a new record in 2021. So the ocean has been doing a service for the planet, but in, the, in that service has, is coming major species die off. Uh, and, and this will give you an idea of the rate. This is the change in heat content. And this is just since 1960. We're not talking about hundreds of years here. Um, half of this increase that you see has occurred in less than 20 years. So between 2002 and 2022, 
Um, and, it, and the heat, heating up of the ocean is not just on the surface, but all the way down to the bottom. So you can imagine that it is affecting the species at all levels within the ocean. Now, I just want to share with you also what that does, what the surface temperature of the ocean does for things like hurricanes. Um, this is last summer. You may remember Hurricane Ida from last summer. Um, I just picked this one. There's so many hurricane stories. There's so many you can't even count them. But that happened to be last summer and it crossed the waters of the Gulf. But at the time that it did, they were seven degrees Fahrenheit higher than normal. And so all that absorption by the ocean that's making surface temperatures warmer is then intensifying hurricanes. And that's one of the reasons that hurricane seasons are lasting longer and that they're more destructive because the water is getting warmer and warmer. Um, now, I also wanted to show you Illinois specifically. Here's the, here's the, here's the projection. And I have a feeling that this projection is going to worsen because this was made a year ago. But they're predicting that the temperatures by 2050 will be 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit hotter, that there'll be much more rain, many more heavy rain events and floods in Illinois, and at least five more days over 95 degrees in this part of the state with more in downstate Illinois, and then a lot more public health risks from the heat and pollution that is also a, a part of the picture. Um, and then I, I, I even looked up data for Chicago. And, you know, I moved here in 1989. And I've no, I don't know about you, but I've noticed how much hotter the summers are. Well, they actually are 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit hotter since 1980. So it's, it's not that long, really, for, for the average temperature to be two and a half degrees Fahrenheit hotter. And because the city has so much cement and so little tree canopy, the city itself is seeing an increased heat island effect. The suburbs are not seeing it as quickly as the city. But later in this century, we're going to have many more days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a prediction that there will be probably 60 days of what is what they what their scientists are calling scorching heat, like like Las Vegas. So essentially, the 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 projection for Chicago is heat, heat, and more heat, and um, that and raining and flooding, a lot more raining and flooding. Uh, now. That's, that's sort of, that's pretty depressing, but it's the poor people in the world that suffer the most. They're, they're the ones who are hit the hardest by everything. I show, I just wanted to show you one picture from last summer when Hurricane Ida hit Louisiana and the destruction in this man, of this man's property. And the people there, so many of them, no homes, no, nothing to go back to. Um, so it's, uh, it's just a, such a sad picture. And, and you may wonder, well, wh what does this, why does all this cause more rain and more flooding when it's, at, when it's hotter? Well, that's because with the ocean being warmer, it evaporates, more, more moisture evaporates off the ocean. So that's carried along in the clouds. And then it causes much heavier precipitation. And then that precipitation rushes into our streams and lakes and causes flooding as it's returning to the ocean. But it's, it's just the fact that the ocean is warmer that is leading to all of these rainstorms. 
In fact, I, I, I just had to show you this one. This is what's called a rain bomb. And these are happening all across the Midwest now. This one's from last summer. And it's where the rain is so intense that it comes, it, it's like a microburst and it just pours water in one small area because the clouds are so filled up with precipitation. And we, we then, you know, it, we, our sewer system can't handle it. And we, we just find ourselves facing the, um, the pain and, and the cost of rebuilding after these kinds of floods. Um, I did, I wanted to show you this because Al Gore took a picture of this himself near his home in Tennessee from August. This is another case of 22 people dying in flooding after uh, that part of the state got 17 inches of rain in less than a day. Uh, and, and so, you know, what, what, you're, what you're seeing really is this increased precipitation. And I don't know about you, but I didn't understand that. I didn't understand that it was coming from the warming of the ocean. But I've now I now sort of have a fix on what's going on, um, and these floods and extreme rainfall events are occurring four times more often than in 1980. So it isn't just your perception; it is in fact the case. Um, these are um, these these global record-breaking precipitation events, and they are on the rise. Uh, all around the world. Al Gore showed us at the training about 30 pictures of precipitation and flooding in all parts of the earth. But the one I did want to show you was, um, that's another example, just farmers losing money because of rainfall. But I wanted to show you Chicago last summer. Did you, you remember the, the big rainstorm and flooding that we had last June? Well, do you see those things spewing up in the air? What, that's the sewer system that got overwhelmed and the manhole covers burst off and sent water and sewage into the air all over the city because they couldn't, the sewer systems can't handle this kind of rain. So the damage that's caused to our systems is quite serious. Um, and, uh, you know, one other city that you've probably heard a lot about, but I, I think it's worth seeing this. I just had to show you this. This is Miami Beach six years ago, and it's happening all the time now. This is high tide uh, on a sunny day. And the streets of Miami Beach are flooding, and that's this poor octopus stuck in a parking garage from, from being brought in at high tide into the city. And this is, um, this is the projection of Miami Beach's future um, after two degrees of warming. Now, we're, we are now at 1.1 degrees centigrade of warming. The, we have warmed 1.1 degrees centigrade. I can't remember, that's about probably three to four degrees Fahrenheit uh, since the 1950s, but this would be after two degrees. Um, it, after four degrees, uh, this would be what our, a coastal city like Miami Beach would look like. Uh, and that means that by the end of the century, we would have property all over the world threatened by coastal flooding, $14.2 trillion worth of property. Um, so you can imagine that the insurance industry is really concerned. And there have been a lot of reports recently by insurance companies about what do we do to, to all these payouts that we're having to make to farmers and property owners and so on. Um, so it's not just people having the problem 
and dying and, and so on. It's property values. So when it hits the pocketbooks of developers and insurance companies, then they start to really pay attention. Um, I do want to also point out, and we're pretty close here to going to our solutions, what, they, what the solutions are. Um, the odd thing in a way is that the same extra heat that evaporates more water and causes all this flooding, it also pulls more, more moisture from the, from the soil in different areas. So then parts of the world have longer and deeper droughts like Africa, Southern Brazil, they've been in such a serious drought. In fact, I think I have a picture of, yeah, this, this, is, this is from last August. Um, they, they're at the point where in their main city, Sao Paulo, they have their water cut off every other night because they don't have enough water. And this is at the same time as we're having these rain bombs in the Midwest, in the Northern hemisphere. So just, so things are, so there's greater drought and then there's greater precipitation and it's all happening at the same time in different parts of the world. Um, and of course, what does it cause? It causes food shortages, water shortages, more than a hundred million people in Africa are lacking food, mainly due to conflict and drought. I mean, those are the big two. And this, again, is just a year ago, February. Um, that it, so, you know, it has ripple effects on growing food, on, on um, every part of life. We may not see it right here in Oak Park and River Forest and Berwyn, but, but I'm telling you, people in other parts of the world are already finding things inhabitable, uninhabitable, excuse me, uninhabitable. Um, I also just wanna mention briefly the fire issue because, because th that has gotten a huge amount of coverage in the press. But I just wanna show you the correlation between Western large fires and temperature. That, that's, they track, they track one another really closely. And so what you've got, well, that was, that was last summer too, the, the, huge, the huge fire in Greenville, the big Dixie fire. Um, but this is the statistic that just blew me away that since 1982, the average number of acres burned in California has increased 500%. And there seems to be no slowing down of this burning uh, of forests in California and land. Um, and, and Oregon and Washington and New Mexico and other states are experiencing the same thing while we are getting too much rain and it's causing our sewers to lose their manholes, you know? So things are out of balance. And these are all the types of infrastructure that are being damaged by extreme weather. And you know where the money comes from to pay for all this, right? It comes from us. It comes from taxpayers because we have to we have to fix our roads and our power plants and our power lines and our aqueducts and our and our sewer systems and so on. So so the cost, the the actual cost of this to people is is quite serious and and will get more so. Um, I also want to just note that we've got a climate migration problem as well. I mean, that's, that's a serious issue too. Um, just, just in those few months, September to February of last year, you had 10.3 million people being displaced by extreme weather. In other words, 
we, we pay a lot of attention to the conflict that causes people to leave, like 5 million people leaving Ukraine, you know, um, but 10.3 million people left in four months because of extreme weather last year. So what we really have here is we have, um, well, and I should have mentioned, and water scarcity, by the way, they're also leaving because of water scarcity. Um, but the world could see up to a billion climate migrants. That's the projection from several reports, including the one I quoted here. People leaving simply because they can't get water or food in the area where they live right now. And, and in Al Gore's most recent training, he showed this. He said, um, this is currently these places are the uninhabitable parts of the earth right now because of no water and such drought that food cannot be grown. So the, the black areas are being hit first. And then he showed us the, the projection for 2070. And when you look at that, that uninhabitable zone spreading out, you're talking about India, Indonesia, parts of South America, Central America. Where do you think those people want to go? They want to go north or far south. That's why there's such a concern about migrants and what we're going to do about it. Because if they can't grow crops or have any water, then they have to leave, you know, and they have to get absorbed by countries in the north or the far south. So I, I think that this, this little slide right here, I mean, I won't be around then by 2070, but our children and grandchildren will be. And so I think this, this is a serious issue. Um, then there's the health threat. That's the, mainly the last thing I wanna mention that, that is something to think about, the health threat. Um, and why is it a health threat? Well, um, as the climate changes and people expand further and further into, into some of the, as development goes on and the population explodes, people are moving further and further into formerly um, unlived in areas. And what that's doing is new infectious diseases are emerging. Um, a lot more diseases are emerging every year than were say 15 years ago. This is just one example, but what is most interesting is that 75% of all the emerging infectious diseases are being transmitted from animals to humans. And they're coming from areas that we didn't used to live in. But, you know, when I, when I was born, there were two and a half billion people on the planet and there are now 7.8 billion. And so obviously we've got to, find places to live for the other 5.5 billion people. And so we're moving into areas we've never been in before. Um, then there's the pollution caused by all these people. And I don't know if you followed this, but there was a very interesting study done. I don't know if it was done, I can't remember if it was done by Harvard or who, but they studied 324 cities in China and they found that um, there was a 22% increase in COVID-19 in areas that had elevated levels of nitrogen and particulate pollution um, where things were, where global warming had caused this kind of pollution. And there was a big correlation with COVID-19. And so I thought, you know, we haven't spent enough time looking at the, the relationship between what we're doing to the ecosystem and these infectious diseases we're seeing that turn into pandemics. I, I think a lot more research will be done on this very issue. I really do think that. Um, 
and it's making life better for infectious diseases. You know, I mean, that's what's happening. Look at, look at the tropical diseases that have moved out of the tropics into uh, the north, out of the middle, out of the equator area. West Nile virus, um, dengue fever. I mean, you, you know, the Zika virus, this is all because the, the growing season, the um, incubation season, season is longer and the air is warmer for longer periods of time. So it's just much, the virus can incubate faster and the mosquitoes breed and they're able to transmit the diseases for longer periods of time. So they, they move. Um, so, you know, I do think that more needs to be done on the health side of this. But it's definitely the case that we're seeing a growth in diseases on the move and pandemics that may come as a result. Um, so I, I, won't, I won't go into detail about air pollution itself from fossil fuels, though it is what I spend a lot of my personal time on. <laughs> you know, um, but I will say this. Um, there was a study done by the American Respiratory Association here in Chicago, and they looked at the number of illnesses and deaths in areas that were closest to the CTA's bus terminals and the places where the CTA buses idle. And they found that there are definitely a much higher number of cases, statistically significant cases of more lung disease, COPD, lung cancer, et cetera, et cetera, for people who live near bus idling places because of the pollution coming from the diesel fuel. That's one of the reasons what, that I'm working really hard on the transportation question in Chicago and trying to force the pace in the CTA to move to electric buses faster than they're planning to because the deaths attributable to air pollution are growing. And we're already in the orange zone here in, in the United States. And then we have the secret, the secret polluter, the secret fossil fuel methane, which is coming from none other than natural gas that we are using to, uh, for our gas stoves and our gas uh, furnaces and so on. And what we found is that methane leakage is 60% higher than we were told during the previous administration. And um, we need to remember that each molecule of methane, just one molecule of methane traps more heat, uh, 86 times more heat than a molecule of carbon, carbon dioxide. So when people say, oh, well, well those certified, those um, compressed natural gas buses, they're cleaner. Well, I would like to say, what about the methane? <laughs> you know, it's really, it's the methane leakage is serious and we've got to get rid of those natural gas buses. Um, and this tells you uh, it told me that the, if the Department of Defense is planning on an adaptation roadmap because they're worried about this, then we better be because they're saying that it will lead to food and water shortages, pandemics, disputes over refugees, destruction by natural disasters in regions all over the world, and they're trying to prepare for it. Um, and so uh, that doesn't often get talked about, but that's something that now the World Economic Forum is agreeing that six of the 10 biggest risks to the world economy, this was, this was um, done before Russia invaded Ukraine. I would be very curious to see what the World Economic Forum has to say now um, about the, the 10 biggest risks. But extreme weather, water crises, loss of, of uh, species, man-made environmental damage, infectious diseases, these are considered the biggest risks to the economy worldwide, and species loss. Um, 
I just went to the Field Museum two weekends ago. And when you finish the evolution of the planet, when you actually finish the whole exhibit, and I really would recommend it if you haven't seen it, there's a little meter at the end and it's talking about the, the sixth extinction, which we are causing, the sixth mass extinction. And it said the number of species that has become extinct since eight o'clock this morning. And the number was 21. And it was about one in the afternoon. So in a five hour period on the one day I happened to be there, 21 species had gone extinct. Um, and uh, that's incredibly alarming. It's, it's a, it, the bio, biodiversity loss and crisis is serious. Um, because we risk losing up to 50% of all of our land-based species in this century. Um, so there's the cost. This is the cost of carbon, and I should add, and methane. Um, We've, and all I've done is just touched on the very surface of these problems. I, if we had five hours, I would go into detail on every one of them. Um, then we might all just be unable to function because it's so depressing. <laughs> so, so I do wanna say that we have the solutions. And, and honestly, that gives me hope. Um, I believe that we can turn this around. We have to have the will to do it. And we have to start, you can, you can do your own things in your own home and your own backyard, but you've also got to act at a broader scale as well. Um, but the important thing is we don't have to invent the solutions. We have them. But we need to remember that we have fewer than 10 years to decelerate global warming. We won't get rid of it, but we could flatten it and cause it to start to come down. Um, we have to do two things, though, to get there. One is to slow down or eliminate emissions. That's obvious, right? I've been talking about emissions this whole time. We have to slow down or eliminate those. And that means electric cars. That means get rid of you know, lots of things that we'll talk about. But at the same time, we have to find ways to pull carbon out of the atmosphere, to sequester it. The, I, I, I think sequester is kind of an interesting word, but it's like drawing it down out of the atmosphere. And nature does that. Nature does that now. If we have good soil, grasslands, trees, wetlands, if we have that, they pull down carbon because that's what causes photosynthesis. And so, you know, we, we have the solutions, but we're eliminating forests and uh, wetlands instead of increasing them. So if we want to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, we've got to do both things. Stop emissions and pull down carbon into the earth. Not the ocean. We don't want to warm up the ocean anymore. We want to pull it down into the soil. And so I'm, I just wanna talk with you a bit about how we could do that and how you could help. Um, there's, it seems like to me, like there's not enough hours in the day to do all the things that I think I should do to make a difference, but even doing anything, I mean, anything at all would, would be a help, <laughs> you know? Um, 
And this is encouraging. If we halted our net carbon emissions, about half of the carbon would be taken out of the atmosphere and absorbed into the ocean and into the trees in about 30 years. And some scientists like Michael Mann at um, the University of, is, is he at Penn State? He's at Penn State. Uh, he said that it could be done in five to six years. If, if we really, if we were, you know, uh, really making decisions in a big way about this, we could do it faster than that. Um, but of course, it's not guaranteed because we've got huge decisions being made at the governmental level or not made at the governmental level that are affecting this. But it is possible to turn this around. Um, and, and this is encouraging. I mean, the new, new electricity capacity just a year ago, year and a half ago, solar and wind were making up 80% of the new capacity. So when, in other words, the new, the new energy that's being uh, created is solar and wind. Um, and as you know, we're trying to close the coal plants in this country, but it's a major battle. Um, and we're trying to get away from natural gas, but that's an even bigger battle. Um, wind energy capacity is just, just going straight up. I mean, we've got lots of new wind capacity. We've got lots of new solar um, installations. Those are rapidly going up, not only here, but all over the world. Um, that, and the cost is coming down. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but I, I thought this was amazing that there's enough solar energy coming from the sun every hour to fill our energy needs for an entire year on the planet. All we have to do is trap it and use it. Um, it's renewable, you know, it's always coming. And if we just store it, we can use it. You know, when people say, oh, but what about if the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow? Well, if we store it in batteries, then we can use it, you know, regardless of whether the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. So the storage capacity is growing like mad and the cost is going down just as rapidly. So this is very promising. We just have to use it. We have to expand it. Um, this, is, this is the exciting thing that um, just eight years ago, uh, solar and wind energy was cheaper in only 1% of the world. Um, but then, not five years later, it was cheaper in two thirds of the world than, than coal and other fossil fuels. And now the projection is within two years, 2024, just two years from now, these sources are gonna provide the cheapest new electricity in the entire world. So economics are gonna drive decision-making because it will be less costly for, for people. Um, and the, these, let's go back and show you that again. I, I wanna show you the countries planning a fossil fuel phase out for vehicles. Um, we're not in that list yet, but hopefully we will join that list. But there are already, phase outs that are going on around the world and more countries are joining all the time. So this is encouraging because it's happening fast and even more encouraging, let me skip this one for now, um, auto manufacturers. I don't know if you heard the big, um, when you heard GM make their big announcement that they were gonna start producing only electric cars after a certain date. Well, all these auto manufacturers are moving to electric vehicles. It isn't just Tesla and expensive cars. It's all these different brands. And electric charging stations are going in all over the place. So there's a, I think our governor wants a million electric vehicles on Illinois roads 
in eight years. That's his goal. And he's trying to find ways to fund incentives for people to buy them. Um, and, and this is what's happening to electric cars globally. I mean, they're, they're growing, uh, I think, let's see, mass production of Teslas was the cause of the biggest growth in the US. Um, but um, just in nine years, the, the number of people buying electric cars around the world has just skyrocketed. And we're behind the curve right now as country. Um, and they're gonna reach price parity by the end of 2022 for um, large cars and in the US and Australia for SUVs. Um, a year from now um, for all segments of the car market in the US um, and by 2024 in Europe for SUVs and mid-sized cars. Um, so, you know, we, that, the idea that electric is more expensive is just about that, those days are over. We're, we're at a point where you can afford to buy electric. And I have a hybrid car, but my next car is gonna be electric. <laughs> I just decided that I, I gotta stop talking about it, I gotta do it. So I'm just going to get an electric vehicle, that's that. And all the buses of the world, 40% of them will be electric in three years. So that's why we want PACE and the CTA to catch up uh, with what's going on around the world. Um, and a bunch of cities have made commitments to buy only zero emissions buses um, starting in just two and a half years. Um, some cities in China are already buying only electric buses. So we, you know, we're behind on this too. We, we've got a ways to go in the US, but it's happening. Um, and then we've got 24 states, including Illinois, that have joined the United States Climate Alliance. I mean, they're, they're gonna meet the Paris Accord. They're, they're making commitments to meet the Paris Accord agreements, um, as are companies, 240 global companies, uh, major, major companies around the world agreeing to go carbon neutral. Um, to eliminate their emissions. I, I don't know about you, but I find those things very encouraging. Um, just just to, to know that governments and big corporations um, are saying, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. Um, and every nation in the world agreed seven years ago that they were gonna achieve net zero gas emissions by 2050. I mean, everybody said they were. Um, they're not re they're not on track to reach that though. But fortunately, we rejoined the Paris Agreement um, after Biden was inaugurated. So we at least have a commitment to get there by 2050. Now the question is, how do we do it? How do you and I do it? And so I just thought that I would take everything that I've been reading, participating in, and just list the things that I thought were doable by us. And just spend first on the personal, and then at the community level, and then the state and federal level. I mean, obviously, switch your electricity supplier. Don't get your electricity from ComEd without looking at what community solar suppliers have to offer. Um, Oak Park has an agreement with a, solar, a community solar supplier, um, but there are others. And if you, if you can in, install the panels on your own roof, because then your electricity cost goes down to nothing and it's even better than going with a community supplier. My neighbor just did it this year, put solar panels on his roof. And because I have a tile roof, I don't think I can do it, but I'm already a member of the community solar supplier called, I think it's called 
Clearway Community Solar. Um, and, and so I, I took that step. I've been trying to say, take one step every few months. Um, also, ComEd will come to your home. I don't know if you've ever had ComEd come to your home, but I did, and they'll do a free um, assessment of what could save you energy. And they'll replace all your lights with LED lights for nothing. If you, if you um, just call them up and say you want, um, you want your, your energy assessment done. Um, they'll replace your shower heads with low flow uh, shower heads. They'll do all of that for you. So, so do that and plant native trees in your yard. Um, there's all this activity going on now to plant trees throughout the Chicago region. Uh, the Chicago Regional Tree Initiative is very exciting because not only are trees more healthy and they reduce the heat island, but they sequester carbon, <laughs> you know, and the more trees you plant and nurture, the better off the planet will be. So I listed three different organizations that you can affiliate with or donate to, but plant as many native trees as possible, as well as native grasses, perennial flowers. The more we can get rid of little grass lawns that, are, that look perfect, but do nothing for sequestering carbon, the better off we will be. Um, and shift to what I would call regenerative practices in your yard or your garden, if you have one, meaning, meaning don't till the soil, don't use pesticides, don't use fertilizers, keep your soil covered up, don't aerate it like landscapers tell you to take those little plugs out of the grass. All that does is release carbon into the atmosphere and it depletes the nutritional value of the soil. So don't pull those little plugs of soil out. I'm seeing them all over the neighborhood and I just wanna go up to every door and say, I don't know who told you to do this, but this is decreasing the value of your soil, not increasing it. So keep your soil covered up, plant grasses, big you know, native grasses, prairie grasses that have deep roots and hold the soil. Um, plant perennial flowers, promote pollinators coming in and, and butterflies and diversify it so that you've got rich soil. That will help with flooding. It, it, it will help a lot. Um, and then, you know, these are all the things, if you've got more land, these are all the things that farmers that are in the know now are starting to do. They're starting to um, use no tilling, they're using cover crops, they're putting in trees, they're not using any synthetics anymore, they're composting and, and um, they're, they're really, uh, they're, they're trying to save the soil because if you save the soil, you can sequester carbon and your, your, your vegetables and your fruits and everything will have more nutrition. There's, there's definitely research to support that. So think about these, these regenerative practices. Um, and then let's switch to cars. Try to go to an all electric car. I took the middle ground and went to a hybrid. I wish now that I, that was four years ago. It's time for a new one. I'm gonna get away from hybrids because we need no emissions. We don't need lower, we need none. <laughs> we need no emissions. So if you have a car, go electric. Um, the charging infrastructure is there. Weatherize your house. That's the other thing, or your apartment or your condo. Insulate, weatherize, and transition away from gas heating and gas appliances. That's the next step, that's my next step is getting a gas, I mean, an electric furnace. I know you heard about heat pumps in a prior presentation and boy, that's what I'm gonna go with because you just have to eliminate natural gas from your house. It's not only emitting methane, it's actually emitting pollutants that affect you. 
So going electric with your appliances is the smart thing to do. And as I said, use public transit if you can. And Phyllis mentioned to me that you'd been hearing about uh, plant-rich diets because, because uh, meat is, um, producing meat is a major producer of um, carbon. So it would be good to eat a more plant-rich diet. I'm not saying don't eat any meat. I'm just saying reduce it. Try to reduce your consumption of meat. That will help a lot. And if you've got any retirement funds or any other investments, tell your investment advisor to get them out of fossil fuels. Get, I did that. I, I did. I I had learned all about it from a, a team I was on. And so I just called them up and I said, I, I want my retirement money to be moved out of all fossil fuel investments. And I was able to move it into socially responsible investments and I didn't lose anything. So think about stopping the money pipeline, reducing plastic pollution. And if, if, if you live in Oak Park, we do have composting services. I don't know if River Forest does, but, uh, or Berwyn, I, I, I don't know. I should find that out, but we have one. And if you don't compost, when you send all your garbage out and it goes into the landfill, it, it emits methane. So if you compost it, it doesn't. So you can do that and you can help your village create a formal climate action plan that's what Cindy and I are working on with the Oak Park Climate Action Network. We're trying to commit to carbon neutrality. We're trying to get the village to, to do it by 2035. I don't know if we'll be successful, but we're gonna try. Um, but you need a climate action plan with a roadmap. And then I, I'm just saying to you, if you really wanna get involved, become a trained certified leader. But, um, I did it three years ago. And it just changed my life. I mean, it truly changed my life. He's trained 35,000 people. Um, and the trainings are free. Uh, there is one in Las Vegas that's going to be the first in-person one since COVID. And it'll be June 11 to 13. And there's no cost. You just have to get there. Um, but you have to apply soon. Uh, if you don't want to go to that one, you can do a virtual one that he'll have later in the year. Um, but there's a there's a website here that you can go to, Climate Reality Leader Training. Um, it they're really good. They're really good and thorough. A and encourage the synagogue or your employer or schools your kids are in or whatever to disinvest in fossil fuels. It, that's all you have to do, just, just explain why it's a bad thing. And then the biggie, we still can pass a climate bill before August, before the August recess in Congress. It's still, there's still a chance that we can get that portion of the Build Back Better bill passed. So tell your legislator that you want that climate bill passed before the August recess because there's a lot going on. If they hear from people, it will make a difference. Um, it, it just just means a phone call or an email to your congressman and your and your and to Durbin and Duckworth. And even though they already support it, they need to know that they have constituents who really care. So, you know, don't say, well, I'm in a blue state, so they're already supportive, so I don't need to call. No, you do, because they need to know how large the support is, how widespread. And then just, you know, make sure that when the midterms come, that you vote for candidates who support combating the climate crisis, that, they, that it's a priority for them. Um, and then I just would say, you know, as I've said, your choices, we've talked about choices, we've talked about voices, we've talked about votes. Th those are the big three, the choices you make, getting your voice heard and voting. Um, those are the big three and, and this planet, this 
you know, what I think is a beautiful planet deserves our attention and our commitment. So that's, that's my overview. Um, and we can talk. Phyllis, you're on mute. Oh, now you're not on mute. No, okay. I'm not. Yeah, I'm just preparing for it. Wow, Pam. Oh, my gosh. I took so many notes. Oh, my gosh. Um, that was wonderful. Oh, I mean... I'm glad you have a lot of actions for us. Um, people have been asking questions and, um, you know, I can read your questions or you can, I, I can, I can call on you and you can just ask them. That would be just fine. Sure. Um, Maury, I know you, you wrote a question way back there when, when Pam was talking about oil. <laughs> uh, you want to, you want to unshare your screen now, Pam, yeah. and we can see everybody. Yeah. 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 Um, and would you like me to, um, do you want to just ask your own questions or do you want me to ask them? I can see. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you were talking about um, insurance companies, um, you know, having to deal with the, 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 the crisis that's created by global warming. So I just asked, well, why do they keep on insuring oil development? You know? I know. I, I, I don't know why, Morris. I don't know why. Yeah. I think probably that those are some of their biggest customers. And, you know, they, they know that those are going to be stranded assets that, that these oil companies and coal companies and so on are not going to, that the value of those stocks is going down. So I, I guess it's because th th their portfolio is made up of enough of them that they can't afford to transition away all at once. That's all I can figure out because they're, the cost to the insurance industry, which is passed on to us, is just growing astronomically. I have some data about that, but I didn't have time to share that. But I, it's crazy that they're still supporting them. Yeah. invest you know it just is it makes no sense to me that's a great question yeah no i um so cindy um i don't know if you're still there and i i'll, I'll read go ahead hi thank you pam i um i put in a few statements that were sort of supportive but of what you were saying um about leaving the leaves on your lawn, beds and grass. You know, I watched somebody with their with their lawn care company the other day blowing the leaves, every single leaf out of the earth that was around the grass, <laughs> just so they could fertilize it later. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but you what? know, it's what people come to expect in their yards. Um, so we need to change that culture. We um, do. And just a reminder that we need renewable energy electricity to charge our electric cars so that they really are clean. Um, but then imagine, um, I was actually thinking about this when we were on the highway, um, where were we last? In DC, I don't remember, somewhere <laughs> where they were building these huge walls to keep the noise out and the pollution out probably for these communities. They were, oh, it was in DC. They are expanding the, they are expanding the metro system out to the suburbs, which is great. And, but I guess one of the conditions was to build these walls, which maybe we wouldn't need if we have quieter vehicles and non-polluting vehicles. Right. Just think of all that infrastructure going into these 50 feet tall walls, so but lots of co-benefits. Um, yeah. And you just made a joke about the training in Las Vegas in June, <laughs> that it would be so warm there to, to make it. No, I, I wonder if he's doing it there just to prove what scorching heat feels like. Yeah. But um, did I have a question? Um, I mean, I think these are all, yeah, really great points and just that, yeah, the community action and everything is really 
key, you know, um, I always just think the behavior change just helps reinforce our own beliefs and, and yes, it has a role, but I think the biggest role is making us, um, you know, it engages people and then they begin to act at a larger scale. Yeah. And so that's, yeah. that's really great. And maybe when I retire, I'll do, go do the training myself. <laughs> I hope so. That'll be great. Thanks. Coming soon, huh? <laughs> um, so I have, uh, you commented on that talking to, to um, you know, wh however you invest your money and to invest it in, um, make sure it's not being invested in fossil fuels. So um, I think it was this past year, I've been to two um, Zoom virtual conferences for, with the big, bold Jewish climate fest. I told some of you about this. Um, last year was when I learned about Trex, the Trex plastic challenge. And Pam, I don't know if you know, we've been collecting, we, we've made, we're, we're on our fifth plastic bench that Trex is giving us free made of plastic bags. No, I didn't know that. Oh yeah, the, the community, haven't you seen that around town? Last I, I have, I have, but yes. Yeah. Yes, um, we started it and a whole bunch of groups were collecting bags and we collected 500 pounds in three weeks when we first started doing it. Now it's going much slower, hopefully because people are not using as many, but I'm not sure that's the reason. Anyway, um, so the second time I went to the Big Bowl Jewish Climate Fest, um, I went to something and I forgot what they called it. Um, I saw, you know, an adjective and investing like climate invested in more or um, maybe- Was it social, social, socially responsible investing? Probably it was one word that, that meant the same thing, yes. And what she said, this was by a, a, a financial planner was talking about it and she's the one who does you know, um, does that kind of investing for people. And what she said is, you know, people are worried about making less money from their investments. She said, but think about it. You're investing in fossil fuels and then you're contributing to all the things that all the, all the groups that are fighting climate change. Right. Just don't support fossil fuels. And I have not done that yet, but I will now. It just feels so good when you know that the money you save for your retirement is not going to them. <laughs> it just feels so good. When I did that, I was like, yes, you know, I, just, I really felt like I'd accomplished something. Yeah. And it just takes a phone call. I mean, it's not like, you know, uh, it's not like an enormous thing to do, you know? So I hope everybody will. So, um, Kayla, oh, uh, uh, Kayla's got something in here. And, and, and Hinda, did, did you have your hand up too, Hinda? Yes, she does. Yeah. Um, Kayla says, thank you for a great present. Everybody's writing, by the way. You're not looking at it. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, it's a difficult topic and hard to know how best to write this ship. Just 100 companies produce 71% of the world's man-made carbon. In addition to the language and push around the language and push around personal responsibility for climate change, actually was a campaign created by Exxon Mobil to deflect from their yes, role. yes, that is exactly right, Kayla. Uh, um, my, in fact, Michael Mann has this book called The New Climate War. I wouldn't say it's a great book, but the point he makes is exactly the point you just made that to focus on just what my carbon footprint is, that was just a way to deflect attention from the fossil fuel companies and the policies that have gotten us to where we are. So that's why I always talk about personal community and policy because it, it, it isn't gonna be solved just because you compost or you gather plastic bags for that matter. Do you know what I mean? I mean, none of those, things individually are going to make enough of a difference. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do them. It just means that that can't be 
your your only focus. If you don't focus on policy change in your community, you know, and at the state level and federal level, it's not going to happen. Hinda, go ahead. Uh, Pam just really almost answered my question and my thoughts. I've been writing to Duckworth and Durban for quite a while, as well as other senators from Massachusetts where I used to live. There seems to be very little political will in Congress about making changes to reduce or eliminate climate change. I'm wondering if the political will has to come from communities, um, not me, but Oak Park and communities throughout the country who are working on a climate plan. Uh, I'm also on a committee to work on the climate plan of Oak Park. And that through all these groups nationwide will affect somehow help to pull a push for a political will to develop in Congress. So it'll come from community. Like you said, Pam, we can't do it alone. We need to be working in community and then maybe from there, we can get to policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, at, at least what you, when you're working locally in, in your own municipality, say, or even in Illinois, you can actually connect with the people. And I mean, let me just give you a quick example. You know, we've really been pushing pace really hard about electrifying their buses. And when I say pushing hard, I mean, we've been showing up at their board meetings, calling board members, talking to them, calling county commissioners, talking to them. And when you are connecting with somebody face-to-face -face in a meeting and saying how important this is, it's different than if you're trying to deal with a, a federal person like Dick Durbin, you know, because they see you, you're in the room um, you can, you can, and PACE has made changes. They have agreed to go all electric by 2040 and to purchase and to uh, step up the purchase of their electric buses. They're not doing it fast enough for us. We're going to still keep pushing them, but they are starting to change. And I think that's just because of the local, the, the, what you can do locally what you can do when you can actually talk to people and have an influence on them. I think that's the way I feel about the village trustees in Oak Park. Yeah. You know, we, we know them, we live here. <laughs> you know, you just are more likely to get response, but it, it still isn't happening fast enough. Yeah, I think one of the challenges is that you know, and I, you know, um, for those of you who don't know, I work at the University of Illinois Chicago trying to advance sustainability. We have this huge energy infrastructure. Well, it's on the campus. It's like a microcosm of what the U.S. has. We have these power plants that have been invested in or, you know, more or less. And, and there is, we're talking about a different way of providing energy, this distributed energy that from our own house to, you know, solar farms to wind farms. And, and having that supply of stored energy and making that transition is really difficult without those incentives, even though this, and the state passed a, a great law, which helps get us there. It only addresses electricity. It doesn't address heating, natural gas yet. Right. right? So that, that will help. And I mean, that was Obama, it was based originally on Obama's law and rules that were about um, dealing with climate change was each state should develop their own plan. Um, but of course, we still do need that federal driver yeah. the incentives to convert Pace's fleet. You know, Pace needs to have some incentives behind, just like you said, for our electric vehicles, you know, we're, our personal purchases will be dictated to a certain extent by a state incentive, a federal incentive, because it makes the, that upfront cost, which, you know, owning an electric vehicle, um, unless you're barely driving it, is going to pay for itself in savings, especially if our gas prices stay where they're at. So, yeah, you know, it's just a matter that people don't always have the upfront cost, nor do our transit systems or our universities or whatever. So having incentives to help get there. And of course, also the technology um, you know, there's there's sort of a lag here, but 
Um, like it, I was really so pleased to see that Israel was on the list of 2030, um, given that we're you know a Jewish group here today, and also um, hearing um, my niece just bought a car in Israel, and she was I, I guess it was more expeditious for her to buy an electric vehicle. So even if that wasn't something she'd really ever considered, mm. and in, in some of these smaller countries, it just makes sense. You don't have to go yeah. the distance we do here to make long, you know, long trips. So, um, you know, we get it. we got to catch up. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. There's uh, one other thing I was when I was reading about um, actually uh, about the uh, the electric vehicles. Uh, what I found a little confusing is that you know Tesla has an app for your car that'll tell you where you can get your car charged. And Ford has an app, same thing, but they don't, they're, they don't, you know, they're not the same. And, right. you know, one, you know, so you have to be, you know, brand loyal, I guess, to get your car charged, you know, depending on who, you know, what car you buy. But that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, it, it doesn't. It, but you know what? The good news is that they are now talking. Tesla is, ha, te, they're having conversations, Tesla and a number of the other electric car manufacturers, and they are starting to figure out how to make their, their um, electric plugs uh, standardized. Well, that, that would be a wonderful thing because they're not standard now. So No, they're not. There's an adapter, but you have to pay for it. Yeah. Right. So I think it will go that way. I, I think that we'll have a common uh, plug-in uh, feature because as soon as other car manufacturers catch up with Tesla, it won't be good for Tesla to have its own separate from everyone else. That's, uh, that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> Me too. Then we have to figure out what condos, buildings, and apartment buildings can do. I'm working on it. Okay, good. All right. 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 <laughs> right. I, uh, all right. Um, Pam, this was great. This was just wonderful. Can't believe it took till now to realize we could have done this on Zoom last year, too. Um, takes a while to, <laughs> you know, realize we are not stuck with what we only thought we could do in person, but we could do this in Zoom and it was terrific, really terrific. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm really glad to meet everybody. This, and this, just, and, and remember, if you want to, you can join the Climate Reality Project. There's no cost. You can join the, pro the project and become involved and I'll be happy to usher you in and then when you're ready to do the training you can great great that's wonderful because um i mean this in particular there are maybe some other people here too or but this is in particular this is our our um our, our social action group and our adama which is the earth group <laughs> the, the, the group that tends to what do we call it? The sustainability. I don't know. It's all connected. We just all connected ourselves because we all care about the same thing. And um, so this is a group could, that could really uh, keep thinking about it. And um, I'll join. Good. Okay. That's good. All right. Well, th thanks to everybody. Thank you.